Dr. Rachel Park will share with us the research she did for her dissertation when preparing for her Doctor of Musical Arts degree. Uh, Rachel came to us in 2017 and she brought with her a loving, generous spirit and we've all been uh, affected by her. This was a woman that's a phenomenal pianist. And uh, Dr. Jones wrote a wonderful piece tonight. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rachel Park. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my lecture recital tonight. My name is Rachel Park, Assistant Professor of Piano at JSU. Uh, the program that I'm going to present tonight is my doctoral lecture recital back in 2020, spring 2020, when the COVID-19 pandemic just arose. I had to record the recital by myself without any audience uh, at the time but I'm so glad to have a wonderful audience like you this evening. I appreciate you so much. My research is about Piano Sonata number 30 in E major, opus number 109, by Ludwig van Beethoven, and toward the movement, the Petrushka, three movements from Petrushka by Igor Stravinsky. Focusing on historical and analytical study for performance guidelines and musical interpretation. Before I perform this evening's program, I will be open with some brief presentation about each piece covering historical and musical aspects of those two master works. Beethoven was born in a musical family in December 1770 in Bonn in Germany as a second child of Johann Beethoven and Maria Magdalena Keverich. His grandfather Ludwig was a greatly respected Karpermeister who was a role model for the younger Ludwig van Beethoven who kept his grandfather's portrait until his own death. Beethoven's early musical training began at home with his father, who was a vocalist at the court of ele Elector of Cologne, studying violin and clavier with him. The first most important teacher for, for him was Christian Gottlob Neffe, who was appointed as the, the organist in, at the court in Bonn. He was a bright and impressive musician, capable in all areas of music and literature. Neffe introduced Beethoven the well-tempered clavier by Be Johann Sebastian Bach and the essay on the true art of playing keyboard instruments by Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach. Beethoven's early training in Bach was greatly influential on his piano playing, compositions, and later on his own teaching, which became the foundation of modern piano teaching and technique. As Ludwig served as an assistant of Neffe, the young Ludwig had the opportunity to participate in the various music making at the court in his teenage. Finally, he became the second organist of the court in 1784. Under the tutelage of Neffe, Beethoven produced his first composition, Variations on March by Dressler, and three early piano sonatas, which were dedicated to the elector Maximilian Franz, who was a great supporter of the art. In 1787, with the elector's support, Beethoven went to Vienna to have a chance to learn from Mozart. The passionate piano playing and outstanding improvisational skills of Beethoven amazed Mozart, whom declared that, keep your eyes on this one. Someday he will give the world something to talk about. In late 1792, a year after the death of Mozart, 22 years Beethoven arrived in Vienna and made it his permanent home until his death in 1827. 
Beethoven began to study composition with Haydn in Vienna. However, events may have differed from Beethoven's expectations. What he needed was not inspired, what he needed was not inspiring lessons, but formal instruction. Uh, John Burke, Burke, a modern Beethoven scholar, asserts that the genius, genius, a genius, creativity, and maturity of Beethoven as a composer indicates that he was actually not a student who came to learn, rather he was already a skillful and finished composer. By his 30s, Beethoven was known as a piano virtuoso and composer in Vienna. But it was around the time Beethoven acknowledged his increasing deafness. However, in 1802, after the deepest depression, he dedicated to take a stand rather than surrender to his faith. That decision is well expressed in the letter known as the Heiligenstadt Testament. Drastically innovative changes are obvious in his array of masterpieces, such as 17 piano sonatas, including Opus 33, Waldstein, Opus 57, Affascinata, and the 4th, 5th, and 6th symphonies, Piano Concerto No. 4 and 5, the Violin Concerto, a set of three string quartets from this middle period between 1802 and 1812. During his later years, from 1812 until his death in 1827, Beethoven composed fewer works. However, the music of Beethoven during these years was the highest artistic achievement. Beethoven explored new directions and elements in his last five piano sonatas, composed between 1815 and 1823. The four movements lay out with a clear sonata allegro form in the first movement, and including the old minuet or scherzo with the trio movements, gave way to a format of three contrasting movements. A meditative and even spiritual aura is present in the Opus 109, which was completed in 1820. During the same period as the Missa Solemnis composed, the sonata was dedicated to Maximilian Brentano, the oldest daughter of Antoni Brentano, who is considered to be possibly the immoral beloved in the unsent letters of July 1812. As it anticipates the Romantic era, Opus 109 is considered to be the most introspective and in intimate of Beethoven's keyboard works. The flowing lyricism, sweeping improvisational passages, dramatic contrasts of harmonies and moods, fantasy and virtuosity, as well as use of innovative form with freeing the work with variations and fugue, thus freeing the work from the typical sonata allegro form, all prove the work as one of the most beloved piano sonatas among Beethoven's last five ones. The pianoforte was under constant development during the classical era as, as uh, innovative manufacturers modified the instrument adding new features. The pianos Beethoven used inspired his compositional style of his piano sonatas also reflects the development of the instrument. Range. Beethoven had composed his 20 sonatas within the five octave range. Beethoven altered some motivic patterns that would have taken him beyond the keyboard range so as not to exceed the five octave range of the instrument he had. If you see the example 2-1, Beethoven changed the 16th note octave tremolo 
in a red box, red box, uh, tremolo sequence in the left hand to three single descending eighth notes due to the limited span of the bass register. If you see example 2-2, the sonata in D major, opus 10, number three, provides an example of the impact of the limited upper register. It is very obvious that the sequential passage in measures between 102, 105, could be in octaves if more upper register keys were available. The pianoforte Beethoven used for the sonata in Opus 109 were the Broadwood and the Herald, which allowed him up to six octaves from C1 to C7. However, Beethoven gradually extended the range in his piano compositions, boldly writing even beyond the six octaves range of the keyboard. If you see the example 2-4, in the third movement, that is the measures 25 to 29 and, uh, of the sixth variation, Beethoven included a C sharp seven, which is out of the range of the pianos he used at the time. This is a buzz on pedals. In Beethoven's time, three different types of pedals were generally available, damper raising, action shifting and dampening pedals. Beethoven often used the damper pedal and the action shifting pedal. In his early sonatas, Beethoven used the knee action control and he used the term senza sordini and con sordini for that. After the foot pedal was invented, Beethoven used the abbreviation PED, pad, or O to indicate the moments of pressing and releasing the pedal. These indications were used in the sonata in E major, opus 109 as well. Especially Beethoven used the damper pedal markings for these purposes in sonata op opus 109. One, creating a de desirable legato. Second, uh, gradation of crescendo and decrescendo. Third, full sonorous son sound. And fourth, uh, dramatic dynamic and timbre contrast. And fifth, seamless transition between movements. Beethoven used the action shifting pedal, which is the una corda, in only handful uh, time for his late sonatas, and at Opus 109 is one of them. There is only one place in the entire sonata uh, in measure 83-84, the second movement, Beethoven indicated the una corda pedal to make the mysterious color to that section. Okay, it is noteworthy worthy to recognize Beethoven used the espressivo marking on the, on the movement, on, on the Opus 109. Um, for repeated sequential passages to indicate a tempo change in all three movements. According to the Kenneth Drake, from his book, The Sonata of Beethoven, he suggested a possible interpretation of the term espressivo as a gradual tempo modification, such as rallentando or freer style of performance. About dynamic, it seems very interesting. Uh, in order to understand Beethoven's intention for musical markings, it is important to be aware of different dynamic levels achieve, achievable on more modern piano compared to the pianos of Beethoven's time. The 19th century piano with its lighter strings, lower string tension, and smaller hammers produced a narrow dynamic range. The figure 2-A shows that. So it is important to acknowledge that the narrow dynamic range of the earlier piano reveals that Beethoven was not always thundering, but was all also deeply sensitive and reflective. So here's the analytical study about 109. The unique aspects of Opus 109 indicate that Beethoven conceived of sonata in a new way 
beyond the bounds of the conventional sonata form. The innovative key selections for the first and second themes and dramatic cre drama created by the contrasting tempo and mood changes, and the adaption of the variation and fugue, fugue former structure for the third movement all set this sonata apart from general classical era sonata. Uh, most significantly, the way in which Beethoven interconnected the three movements created a thoroughly unified sonata as a whole epic work. First thing, the third intervalic motivic is significant. And so, the intervalic of third which opens the sonata is even prominent in the beginning of the second movement and the theme and variation of the third movement. Secondly, the same bass line is used in all three movements of the Sonata 109. It appears as the descending scalar shotgun bass and in the first two movements and as a rising scalar bass line in the third movement. This analyst is supported by Ken Bazena. So he said, the first and second movement as a whole act in a kind of thesis and thesis relationship to which the third movement song-like theme and variation acts as a resolving synthesis, both mo motivical and tonally. Third, Beethoven, Beethoven used double bar lines between movements and placed it only one final bar line at the end of the entire sonata. So if you see the uh, figure 3-7, it shows that the vowel line throughout the sonata found in the Beethoven's manuscript. The use of two single bar lines at the end of the first and second movement are of uh, special sig significance. Uh, these two single bar lines are normally used for the key or middle change, not for closing movements. It indicates Beethoven's own view that the first two movements are st structurally incompleted without uh, the third movement. Thus, the entire sonata stands together as the integrated work. Through his entire life, Beethoven devoted much of his compositional output to piano sonata, which some consider to be the single most important category among his compositions. The composer's trans transcendent, crystallized artistry is clearly written on the manuscript of the last chapter of his life. The drama, fantasy, and genius of Beethoven flow through all the movements of 109. The sonata is such a sublime work among Beethoven's 32 piano sonatas. Thank you.
The next piece is Trois Mouvements de Petrushka. Uh, three movements from Petrushka by Igor Stravinsky. Uh, it is a transcription for piano from the Orchestra of Music for the ballet Petrushka, which is the masterpiece established Stravinsky as a pioneer of modern music. Trois Mouvements de Petrushka is greatly admired as one of the most challenging pieces in the piano repertoire due to its virtuosity and orchestral writing. Stravinsky treated piano as a mechanical instrument. Along with that, the composer intentionally limited musical indications such as dynamic, articulation, and pedal markings in this work increasing the challenge for pianists as they seek to interpret Trois uh, Mouvements de Petrushka in accordance with Stravinsky's ex ex expressed desires. The purpose of this research is to provide a performer's analysis of the work and to offer insight into technical issues and musical interpretation to assist Performing performers in recognizing Stravinsky's concept of how the piece is to be performed. Igor Stravinsky was born into a, a affluent and musical family in Oranienbaum, Russia. His father, Fyodor Ignati Ignatievich Stravinsky, <laughs> was exalted as a bass baritone singer with the Imperial Opera in St. Petersburg. His mother, Anna Korolova Kolodovskaya, was a well-educated woman who was a gifted singer and pianist. In his youth, Stravinsky frequently spent time in his father's library where a subst substantial collection of music and books by great composers and authors were available over there. Stravinsky also regularly attended operas, concerts, and ballet with his family. Such a rich musical environment fostered Stravinsky's dreams of a life in music from his early age. The wide personal connections of his father created wonderful opportunities for Stravinsky to meet with a great composers of the time, including Rimsky-Korsakov, Borodin, and Mussorgsky. Uh, Stravinsky went to a law school in accordance with his father's wishes, but it did not take long for him to realize that law was not to be uh, his life life's work. Instead, Stravinsky began to study in counter, uh, the counterpoint, composition, and harmony with Rimsky-Korsakov. In 1909, the presentation of the Scherzo Fantasy and Food Artifice created a new opportunity for Stravinsky. Sergei Diaghilev, the impresario of the Ballet Russe, commissioned him to write music for the ballet. After the great success of the Firebird in Paris, Stravinsky's first stage work for the Ballet Russe, Stravinsky became known as a promising composer. His rela relations with his contemporaries in Paris, including Debussy, Ravel, uh, Manuel de Poya, um, were strengthened during this time. Soon after the great success of the Firebird, Stravinsky began composing a new piece for orchestra and piano, in which the piano had a significant role. In late summer of 1910, Diaghilev heard the first two movements of the new work and recognized the dramatic subject and style to be effective on stage. So Diaghilev persuaded him to use the music for his next ballet, Petrushka. Uh, the ballet, uh, the synopsis of the ballet with the f uh, has the four tableaux was printed in the Russian and f in both languages, Russian and French, in uh, in the 1911 score. Uh, the first tableau, uh, the characters are at the um, Shore of the Tide Fair in Saint Petersburg in 1830s, as the showman plays his flute. 
the three puppets, Petrushka, the ballerina, and, and the Moor, become alive, and all three join in the energetic Russian dance. The setting of the second tableau in uh, Stravinsky's room. He loves the ballerina, but she loves the Moor. When the ballerina comes to Petrushka's cell, he jumps with a great joy, causing the ballerina to run away in fright. Uh, Petrushka suffers from the rejection, Russell in agony of sorrow. The third tableau occurs in the Moor's cell. As Petrushka witnesses the dance of ballerina and the Moor, he is devoured by uh, jealous and hatred toward the Moor. Petrushka challenges the Moor until the Moor kicks him out of his cell. The fourth tableau, it is the evening of the fair. The crowds create the festival and most festive atmosphere, and the dances of the groups of wet nurses, gypsies, and coachmen are disturbed as the three puppets appeared from behind the curtain. Petrushka tries to flee from the Moor, who finally kills Petrushka with a big knife, skimitar. The agitated crowd surrounded, uh, surrounds the dying Petrushka, whereupon the showman appears and reassures that crowd that Petrushka is just a puppet made of wood and sawdust. But the ghost of Petrushka appears above the little puppet theater, sneering at the showman and crowd and the crowd who had have been fooled by him. That is the story of Petrushka. And in 1920, 10 years after the completion, completion of the ballet music, Stravinsky transcribed the music from the ballet Petrushka for piano solo and dedicated it to uh, Arthur Rubinstein. Stravinsky's intention for the work is addressed in his autobiography. He wanted to provide a modern music for pianists to display their virtuosity. As the title indicates, the Trois Mouvement de Petrushka includes just three out of the four scenes in the original orchestral ballet music. Starting from the Russian dance, cheerfully opens the work with percussive intonations and toccata-like character. Through the second movement, Petrushka's room depicts the suffering of Petrushka in agony and love with the cadenza-like virtuosic piano passages, magnificently convey the various human emotions of Petrushka wrestles with. Finally, the last movement is the great finale of the work with various virtuosic technical passages, such as glissandi, extreme lips, and the chordal tremolos. Here are three unique aspects of the Tua movement de Petrushka that I would love to point out. First of all, Stravinsky utilizes the innovative musical texture and harmonic language throughout the work, which makes Tua de Mouvma Petrushka difficult to understand the, uh, completely with the traditional tonal theory. The ambiguity of key relations with the key signatures impacts the actual sound of the music, which is caused by bitonality and diatonic modes employed in the work. Especially the unique harmonic features of the second movement is the tritone found in the Petrushka chord, which consists of the F sharp and C sharp major triads playing both together at the same time. Uh, from a pianistic perspective, it is beneficial to consider the opinion of Charles Joseph. He says that it sounds it sound has everything to do with the division inherent in the keyboard lay, keyboard layout. Stravinsky writes with the physical structure of the keyboard in mind, whereby the black keys and white keys retain their own autonomy in sharpening, sharpening the clash he desired. His perspective is truly helpful for pianists to learn and practice the passages with harmonic ambiguity uh, much easier and effectively. Secondly, the unique pianism of Stravinsky. Stravinsky opposi uh, Stravinsky's opposition to the emotional sensitivity of 19th century music 
led to an international intentional retweet and expressive indications in his music. The limited dynamic articulation and pedal markings in Stravinsky's work challenges pianists as they seek the produce and interpretation in a certain with the composer's desires. Stravinsky's compositions are significantly different from uh, other his contemporaries, Russian contemporaries, such as Rachmaninoff, Scriabin. While Scriabin and uh, Rachmaninoff wrote in richly lyrical phrases, used the damper pedal generously and utilizes rubato for deep emotional expression. However, the com conversation between Arthur Rubinstein, the composer, supports the possibility of using pedal to create the orchestral sonority ideal for the performance for the second movement, though. <laughs> Um, let me see. Also, all the elements of the orchestral score are extracted into the piano transcription. Orchestral score has more detailed musical markings, such as dynamic and articulations, which were not indicated on the piano transcription. If you see the left side of the orchestral music, you can see more dynamic markings and more detailed articulations are marked than the com uh, compared to the piano score on the right side. So it is necessary for pianists to, to study orchestral score and listening to the orchestral music to study more detailed dynamic and articulation expressions for performance. Um, okay. Orchestral writing creates a demanding challenge for pianists who are required to perform unusual technical passages with extremely wide lifts and chordal tremolos, chordal scales, and complex texture. In performance aspect, the instantaneous relaxation of the wrist and forearm rotation and the flexible and taut finger joints are the key to play these technical passages in the work. Finally, adapting Russian folk songs. As with other early 20th and 20th century composers, such as Bartok and Prokofiev, Stravinsky found elements of folk, folk, music, folk music to be the perfect resource for his composition. For thematic material in Twa movement of Petrushka, Stravinsky adapted five Russian folk songs from the collections of Rimsky, Korsakov, Tchaikovsky, and others. Stravinsky's use of these folk tunes for Trois du Mouvement Petrushka was a brilliant choice, for it allowed the composer to create a work characterized by colorful timbre and cheerful atmosphere full of character, rhythmic irregularity, and percussiveness. The metrical difficulty is a definite challenge for pianists, particularly in memorization of the piece. However, locating the intimate folk melody and the segment, segmented thematic materials throughout the piece is very helpful for pianists in learning the work, as well as in determining the desired voicing and memorizing for performance. So I'm going to perform the Petrushka, uh, this piece. Tua Movma de Petrushka is one of the greatly admired concert piano work by Igor Stravinsky. Its virtuosity and pianistic brilliance influenced by the orchestral writing, while the piano is treated as a mechanical, percussive instrument. The full of rhythmic energy, colorful harmonies, and Russian traditional contexts are uniquely presented. Hope you enjoy the performance. Thank you.
This is very meaningful recital for me, sharing my doctoral re lecture recital program with you in this evening. This moment, so many names and faces of the people who guided and supported me, my journey of life, also those who, people who have been with me during the time of joy, sorrow, happy, discouraged time, anger, and all various time, times. First of all, I would like to express my thanks to and love to my husband, Ezra, who's watching at home with the three kids. <laughs> at home, <laughs> I couldn't come. And my three children, Isaac, Joshua, and Esther, especially my first son, Isaac, wake me up in the 3 a.m. in the morning and 5 a.m. in the morning. You gotta practice. <laughs> Did you memorize the piece? <laughs> he checked on me. I also would like to thank to my parents and especially my in-laws who visited often time and stayed with us months, months to encourage and encourage and support me and my family. Special thanks to Mr. Mark Dupont and Dr. James Woodward whom helped me this recital wonderfully with technology. Thank you so much. I would like to express my grateful heart to my, heart to my teacher, uh, who's watching in Texas now, Ro Dr. Robert Smith and Dr. Jill Spranger, Dr. Lott, Dr. Burgraff, Dr. Ho Dr. Moira Hoffman, Dr. Hassong, who taught me in Carson Newman College for one semester, Dr. Song, Dr. Koffer, Dr. Annual, Dr. Lim, Dr. Jong, uh, Mr. Jongmun Kim, and Mrs. Shin Hyung Kim, and all the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary friends and faculty members. I would like to express my thanks to my friends and my families at the First Baptist Church in Maple, Texas, Calvary Korean Church in San Diego, Korean Presbyterian Church in Anniston, First Baptist Church in Jacksonville, and the King's Press and the Pilgrim Ensemble in South Korea, especially to the JSU families. I love you. If I could mention each of your names, you're there. <laughs> For the last and the best, I would like to give thanks to my Lord Jesus Christ. He is the life and the reason for me to play the piano. So I would like to close this recital with my own hymn arrangement, Great is Thy Faithfulness. I hope you can find him in your life. Okay, thank you.
if you want, I prepare one more song. <laughs> uh, my parents are uh, watching uh, this recital from Korea, and uh, this is her favorite uh, piece. Uh, uh, I would love to uh, play for her and my parents, even my in-law. Thank you so much. Fantasy Imprompts. <laughs> 